Rollin'? We got G Baby in the building. How you doing today, bro? Good, buddy. You good? Yeah, I'm doing very good, man. Yes, sir. Uh, before you got in here, we talked about how you played at some hockey, man. Oh, man. What's up, bro? Man. Were you uh, going to the NHL? Where were you man, going? Man, so look, you know how everybody get on your podcast, get to talk about they the first rapper, do this, do that. Please be lying. Mm-hmm. I'm the first rapper officially that play hockey on some real sh- You know what I'm saying? And uh, I don't know, man. It just started when I was younger, man. You know what I'm saying? Uh, all my older brothers played and shit like that. It might be the light skin in me, for real, too. You know what I'm saying? I take over my white side when it comes to that shit. <laughs> but, man, I just, uh, like I said, I've been playing my whole life, bro. And in high school, I was the captain of warm my hockey. And then I couldn't get my grades up to go all the way. So I started rapping and fucking hoes. And that was the distraction. And it took me that way. And I wasn't focused on that. You think you could have made it to the league? I think I really could have made it to the league, bro, for sure. If they didn't make it, you know how college be, you got to have grades and shit like that unless you, like, top-tier athlete, whatever, they walk you through that shit. Mm -hmm. But, like, I wasn't, like, shocking shocking the state on how good I was. But I could have definitely went to the league, for sure, for sure. Damn, all right, shit, that's a big statement. For sure, for sure. Um, So you decided to get into making music now what was kind of the start of music for you what was the first days you realized you wanted to get into music uh so it really all started it's gonna get deep when it come to music because uh it all started when i was seven years old Mm. so when i was four years old i got into a bad bad car accident Mm. in toledo i was hit by a semi truck and shit traffic jam so long story short i was uh i got a brain injury and all that so my I was in a recovery program like for handicapped kids and shit like that. And we used to do a whole bunch of shit, man. We went from like the Michigan Raceway, all this other shit type shit. But like I was never really interested in like the activities we were doing because I recovered differently than like all the other people. So like I felt like I was there and other people weren't, whatever. But like one day we went to the studio and did a song for the camp and I was just like Ever since that day, I was just completely intrigued by the shit. And then I came home literally that day, had my uncle burn some 50 Cent instrumentals, and I'd rap his lyrics over his instrumentals. Ah. And that's how I started with my practicing, like literally, like my cadence and delivery was just growing off that, and I ain't even know type shit. Because I was too young, I couldn't rap, write music and shit like that, you know what I'm saying? So that yeah. was my way to be a rapper back then. You know, that gave me a flashback because, you know, a lot of people say, like, when they started making music, they would rap over, like, old instrumentals, you know, 90s, early 2000s stuff. Yeah. I literally used to have two radios, um, and you could record tapes on them, and I used to pretend I was on the radio, literally. Oh, I, I did not, I fucking I can't believe I just remembered that. I used to fucking do that. I used to pretend like I was on the, and now look at me, motherfucker, like, I'm motherfucking <laughs> on a pipe. That is, like all a- makes, it all makes sense. So it all started at a young age, and for whatever reason, mm-hmm. with the music coming out and the ability to record over it, it just fascinated you. Yeah, and absolutely. Continue from that point. So did you focus on it, or did you kind of leave it behind after I left it behind, bro, because I was so, like, it was hockey. Hockey, mm. hockey, hockey, like, since I was, like, able to skate at, like, three years old type shit, you know uh. what I'm saying? So I was just really doing that, and but, like, the only thing, like, I, I ain't play other sports. I'd play, like, football for, like, a rack, basketball for a rack, all that other, like, regular shit, but, like, I was in travel hockey and all that, so, like, that was my main focus. But by the time I got to high school... Like, I had the newest car, like, the freshest little nigga in high school, all that shit. So, like, yeah. as soon as I knew I wasn't going to college, like, my junior year, I just, like, me and my friends, we started rapping. We made this song called Two Words, One Finger. Like, it was Two Words, One Finger, fuck niggas type shit. And, like, we put that shit on SoundCloud and went to school the next day and just everybody was talking about it. Everybody was fucking with it. And that's when, remember the starter packs when everybody's making starter? Yeah, they had like a G Baby starter pack. It had like the charger, microphone, hockey stick, and like a motherfucking, uh, I don't know, like a, like a white bitch on it because I used to fuck all the white hoes type yeah. shit. So that was like my little starter pack type shit. And like it was funny then. Like that was actually, that was like the hate niggas that did that. But like I embraced that shit and kind of just rolled with it and like made a joke out of it. Yeah. And like just kept posting that and posting music and shit like that. And like, It just kept going, bro. Like, I was in a music group at that time, so niggas was just making music and, like, dropping this shit. And then that all kind of went left, bro, because, like, I I was talking about I got in an accident and shit. I had came up on a little money. When I turned 18, I got a little money, nothing crazy. But, like, I started funding everything. And then, like, when I started funding everything, the niggas in my group were acting weird because, like, 
I was paying for the videos. I was paying for, like I said, I was paying for everything. I was paying for, like, nigga want to do a single? I pay for the studio shots and for bro to do a single. You know mm. what I'm saying? I was kind of like managing the group or whatever, but I was peeping niggas acting weird and goofy. Mm. So I just cut into it like, yo, what's the deal with the whoop? And niggas wasn't feeling me at that time. So I was like, fuck it. Y'all niggas ain't feeling me. I ain't feeling y'all. So really, I cut ties with niggas and then I went my own way on some regular shit like there's some solo dolo shit. And that's when my man's had got back from the military. Mm. So we started going over to Canada. And that's when, once I went over to Canada, bro, like, Really, again, back to that first rapper shit. I'm the first nigga in the city to do that, bro. Like, went over to Canada, bro, and then grew my fan base crazy. Came back here, paid for a one-on-one with BJ, or, uh, DJ BJ. Mm. Bro, was fucking with me, and that's when I signed DJ BJ. Uh, bring your mic close. What do you need? Okay, and so let's continue from that point of uh, you being the second artist to ever be signed to DJ BJ. Yeah, yeah. So, um... Yeah, that was a, if T Grizzly was signed or when I don't really know that situation, but I know he had a, his hands in on that situation for sure. But yeah, man, I just knew BJ was like the pioneer of the city, bro. You know, like you get in front of him, he could really make shit happen. And like I was, uh, what was I like 19 when I sat down with him? And bro just seen something different in me, seen something in me that other people didn't. You know what I'm saying? And and took the chance on me and kind of went from there, bro. You know what I'm saying? Well, just, let's uh, let's um, just talk about the Canada. Um fan base that you built how did you do that so it's crazy i had uh me and bro went over there and we met these two bitches at uh, downtown at this club called imperial and uh the two bitches was hoes but they knew everybody but they was like slut sluts like because they knew everybody off that fact you know what i'm saying so we coming to canada we don't know who hoes and who sluts whatever we just trying to get some get some canadian you know what i'm saying <laughs> we on that so uh, we had a link with them, and the bitch took a picture of my car. I used to have a, uh, my first car to charge and shit. I threw the Lambo doors on it, all that shit. So uh, it was a little different to be over there, and they ain't never seen no shit like that. Like, over here, you see that shit. But, like, they ain't never seen no shit like that. So the bitch Snapchat in my car and posted on her Snapchat, and everybody was like, who's that, who's that? And she was like, you know, that's G&D from Detroit with the whoop. And then he was like, and they told us to uh, pull up to this spot called Suicide Hill where everybody used to hang out in Canada. They shut that bitch down, nah. But uh, we pulled up to that bitch, and it was just all the hoes. Everybody, like, my boy Stanky and shit like that. He's a super popular kid, little rich nigga in Canada, all that other shit. So we pulled up there, we met everybody. And then, like, it was really on from there, bro. Like, it was really just, like, that was getting me on video, like, Snapchat, freestyling and shit like that. And, like, we just ended up at the parties. And then coming back next week, going to another party. And then it just really started with the parties and freestyling at the parties. And then it went to, shit, two years down the line, me pulling up to a school, shutting it down. Damn. You know what I'm saying? Like, I pulled up to uh, St. Anne's in Canada. And then after St. Anne's, that was a big-ass outcome. That shit's all on my Instagram. After St. Anne's, I did Riverside. Mm. And I used to cross the border and throw out shirts and shit like that to all the fans and shit. They had SWAT come out on me. Ah. All the other shit. Because somebody called the police at a... Uh, I had a gun on campus or at the school campus or whatever. Like, how'd you handle that situation? You can't. Oh, uh, with the situation, yeah, with put the your hands up. Yeah. Fuck, <laughs> that's Canada. I don't imagine what they doing when they hear guns over there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They shoot niggas over here. So instantly when the feds rolled up, you know, I'm not putting my hands up and shit. They tripping. And uh, like I said, really just got out of that situation. I ain't had no gun on me. How am I have a gun on me? I'm crossing the border. And I let them know, like I'm doing y'all people a favor for real, like. I'm giving out free clothes, merchandise, shaking hands, kissing babies for real. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm. really out here interacting with the people. Yeah. And that's when, that was like the highest point of my career for real because I was really touching hands and like really like being in front of these kids that really looked up to me, like idolized me type shit. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So that was his major at that point. But then COVID came and shut that shit down. And then for like two and a half years, I just started going back over there. I had a show or a club event over there last Friday, my boy a Rab Joe booked me. Sold out. Damn. And I didn't even think it was gonna, you know what I'm saying? The whole club sold out. I forgot, I, I'm thinking people kinda, you know what I'm saying, forgot, whatever got out the wave, no. All love, right back again type shit. So I'm really getting back into that field as the going over there, striking that market again, you know what I'm saying? Cause the borders are open now, so I could do that. I had an interesting talk with some friends from the industry about that the other day, and I kind of made a statement saying, like, I feel like if you can't make it here first, then it's gonna be very difficult to make it anywhere else. Yeah. But like, you figured out a way to yeah. make it somewhere else. Well, I think it's because, you know, like, 
it's the image I carry, like that pretty boy image type shit, you know? And like with Detroit, I feel like I was, uh, I almost lost myself trying to chase who I wanted to become. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And I I had to kind of look in the mirror and just like, like realize that that's not who I, who I want to be, you know what I'm saying? At all. Like you kind of fall into the gimmick because that's what people want to hear from mm. you because we in Detroit, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm not saying I'm the toughest nigga. I ain't no fucking savage. I never claim to be, you know what I'm saying? But, like, n- niggas know I ain't no hoe, you know what I'm saying? I be around that type of group, but I don't got to portray that. You know what I'm saying? So I kind of just had to come to realization, like, bro, like, it ain't that ain't for me. You know what I'm saying? The Detroit wave ain't for me for real. Wow. And it kind of it was, you know what I'm saying, like the Mile High Club record with uh, hell of a shit. It was rolling, you know what I'm saying? But it only got to a certain point. Because, like, it wasn't accepted in Detroit. Like, you ain't gonna see a nigga come, like, riding around saying, uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh. Nah, they wanna talk about bitches' hoes and selling dope. You know what I'm saying? Man. So. Wow, that is super fat. You're probably the first person on the show to make it outside of Detroit as yeah. far as you made it in a different city. And yeah. I love how you said that you didn't want to follow the trends and the ways or try to fit in. You weren't trying to fit in. Yeah, You absolutely. knew that was going to be a mistake. Absolutely. Um, now, was it a conscious decision when you decided to go to Canada, or was it just, again, it was just that circumstance that had happened that coincidentally made things work out for you? It was basically that. Like, it just, it was really... Like just are you talking about after or before? Before, like the moment, like I know you had went there. It was it, it was kind of coincidental that? Yeah, we was just going there because we was nineteen. We could drink there. So imagine if you go to different states besides, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. In, in different areas. You, exactly. Who knows what could happen? And, and I think that's a problem with a lot of people when they are coming up in Detroit. They feel like they have to fit the Detroit mold. And that kind of suppresses who they really want to be as an artist because you feel like you have to fit in, you have to accommodate these types yeah. of groups and stuff like that in order to make it. But you are an example of somebody who said, hey, you can make it outside of Detroit. Absolutely. Um, now talk about uh, the feelings you were getting a little bit, just to expand to younger artists, how you were feeling trying to fit into the Detroit scene. It was like, you know, like, it wasn't really that I wasn't feeling like myself because I'm not from Detroit. Like, real shit, I'm a nine-mile nigga, like, I ain't, I ain't, I'm a mile north of Detroit and it's damn near like right in the border of the suburbs type shit, you know what I'm saying? So, but it's more like I, my, I was raised by a nigga, like I know who the fuck I am, you know what I'm saying? But it's just like I can't get lost in, in trying to chase that scene because like I don't got to do that shit. Mm-hmm. I ain't never had, like I ain't never had what I wanted to growing up, but I ain't never not had not shit, you know what I'm saying? So... It's like, I don't need to portray that shit, basically. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Now, talk about these hits you got going on. Um, talk about this hit with Hell of a... How did this come together? So, uh, it really, it all started when I did that one-on-one sit-down with BJ. And um, it was weird how it went because, like, my best friend, like, my big homie, Paulie, he dirty glove. You know what I'm saying? So, he had reached out to me like, yo, you know, BJ pitched me your page or whatever. Let's link up. Talk about management. I was actually coming back from Canada. So I linked up with Paulie and Reggie. They, uh, like, Dirty Glove management type shit. And I had locked in with Dirty Glove, like, like heavy type shit. And they took me through, like, the artist development ropes, like, going to, like, the the uh, performances, the little showcases and shit like that, doing radio interviews and all that other shit. And then, you know, Dirty Glove got tied. So I just woke up and I just ended up in the studio with hell of a type shit and hell of a already had a hit for me he had the hook you know what i'm saying so all i had to really come with was like the melodies the verses you know what i'm saying and he had the whole idea so i had to come with the rest of it type shit you know and that's kind of how it just it, it, it molded like that and it just worked out and like the politics behind it just played out right into a certain point like because i had wjlb on my side heavy and that, that it's not like that now but like back like three, four, five years ago, or four years ago type shit, you know, kind of WJLB and Hot 107 was kind of in big competition. You know what I'm saying? So I had WJLB so on top of, like, on a train and, like, rolling, but, and that's why I was going to get into politics. It was kind of like right when I signed a DJ BJ, it was kind of like, you know what I'm saying? It was like, oh, you 107 type shit? You a 107.5 artist? Like, and it's just kind of like the radio support from that end kind of just disappeared. Wow. Type shit, you know what I'm saying? That's why 
another thing with the city. It was like, it, like I said, it ain't like that no more because, you know, like you got like the DJs, like Dr. Darius and all them. They never, they was never with that. Oh, you from that side? Brother? Fuck that. You know what I'm saying? It was always this mutual and it was all love and support. But like, it was just the corporation behind it for real. With the WGLB, they wasn't, they ain't want a hot 107.5 artist to be getting played all day on their radio station. You know what I'm saying? So I had three records in rotation. It was, Mile High Club, Not Me, and um, what other one was in, like, uh, I think it was, Like Boom was in rotation over there. And it was just spinning, like crazy. And like I said, right when I announced I signed, it just stopped. Wow. Stopped. I'm talking that day. Stopped. And then I was supposed to do the LCA show. Stopped. He was, he was not, that from WJLB, they was hosting that. They said, hell no. They didn't put me on that, you know what I'm saying? But it was no, it was nothing like personal, at all. Like now that I know, like you know what I'm saying, growing up, I see how it is. Like it was not really personal. It was just more like I said, politics behind it. You know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to understand the politics. Like it just it hurts them because you're with a different, you you're representing somebody else. Like, like I said, it was it was. I know they gonna hate me for that, but it's, I'm just being real. Like it was just you know like. BJ carries a lot of jealousy. Like, a lot of niggas is jealous of DJ BJ. You know what I'm saying? So, like, they knew he had his hands fully on me. So, it was just, like, I can't support him and this little nigga because they going to blow and it's just going to be like, I don't, you know what I'm saying? They didn't want to see that really happen, I feel like. Mm. And like I said, not all the DJs over there, but it was definitely a certain... Certain couple that was, and they know who the fuck they is. I mean, yeah, man, you know I, and that, that shit's real because, like, I told this story multiple times, but I've been in rooms where people have said that they fuck with somebody, but they're not going to support them because they don't want them to blow up. They're like, it's my time to shine right now. I'm a, nah, I'm not going to support somebody. That shit, that shit is real shit, bro. That shit, and 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 I feel like that's kind of like the Detroit mode. That's the only like you know how the light just shifted on Detroit. That's the only still negative thing about our city that needs to surpass. And I think it's gonna, you know what I'm saying? Mm. I think it's gonna be over with, but, like, that's still one thing. Like, a nigga be like, I fuck with him, but I'm I'm doing the same shit. So I can't fuck with him more than I fuck with myself. You know what I'm saying? And really, it ain't like that. Niggas can't look at it like that because, you know what I'm saying? Once the light's here, it's here yeah. fully, you know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you, man. Um, what are, what are the steps after you have these hit records in rotation? Everything stops. What do you do after that? It was, that's a like it all like so the hit records was coming. I kind of what it was is I was going out. I was so fascinated by like, just like being underneath BJ, and all the attention. And I'm a young nigga too at this time. I couldn't even get in the clubs. You know what I'm saying? Like legally drink none of that shit. So. I'm just coming around and just so fascinated by the shit going on. I kind of like wasn't recording music how I was supposed to be, you know what I'm saying? I wasn't really in the lab like that, you know what I'm saying? And I had a, like, you know, bro gave me a reality check for real. And that's when like I kind of ducked off. That's when like niggas stopped seeing me around BJ because it wasn't, it wasn't that. It was like, bro was like, bro, get the work. So like instead, like I had to come to a conclusion, like nigga, I'm about to be in a club. And pressing hoes or should I be in the lab working on my music? Mm. And that's when I learned, I got my own studio on the east side. And then I learned how to engineer myself. My boy taught me type shit. So I was just not, niggas stopped seeing me. I was just in the style of studio rat. Still him to this day, you know what I'm saying? But I just like stayed in that bitch. I wasn't really moving, doing nothing else but recording music. Mm. And it benefited me too because I got literally probably... I got a lot of music, bro. Like, I'm talking, like, high-quality music, and it's not Detroit shit. So I honestly feel like I have music that niggas aren't capable of making. Mm. And I haven't dropped it because I know the timing ain't right right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm kind of more, you know, BJ kind of stepped off the scene. So he ain't managing or, like, he don't have a music label no more. He, You know, he's, he's got a, he has a daughter. He running a business, you know what I'm saying? A successful business. He's doing his thing on that end. Yeah. So, like, the music, kind, like, I kind of went more independent now. Okay. So, like, I'm, like, more of an independent artist now, so I kind of got to take things on my hands. And, like, you know, I just got my own house, got a car, you know what I'm saying, bills hit. 
Like it's just, it's not easy to just video, 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 drop, drop, drop anymore. Yeah, man. You know what I'm saying? It was easy because bro used to do it all for me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Now you have to kind of market yourself and strategize for yourself. Exactly. Exactly. So. But you're the type of artist that you know a lot of artists don't know when the time is to have a manager or have somebody supporting them, and you were that artist that you did need that. Like, yeah. You proved that you need that help. Yeah. And absolutely. That support. Absolutely. And when it gets taken away, it's like, okay, you're kind of on your own now. Um, so now, we, are you still at that point now? It's kind of like revamp time. Now it's kind of like uh, turn it back up that's, time. That's exactly where I'm at right now, bro. You know what I'm saying? It's like I kind of just watched people that was, one. I'm not going to say underneath me, bro. Like these niggas weren't underneath me. Like niggas been working, but like I've been, I don't watch niggas that was like, I was a little bit hotter than at that time. Like, sign deals and shit like that now and it's like oh shit like shit getting real like these little niggas is like just like I, I damn near had a bigger record at one point than these niggas and they signed a big boy deals now you know what i'm saying like yeah it kind of it, it i'm not the type of nigga to ever get jealous I, I like to get influenced like you know what i'm saying i see a nigga and i get influenced like okay he can do it and he was underneath me at one point i know i can do it because i've always been up there you know what i'm saying and i've never had like like one thing with Detroit too, I feel like it's a uh, a lot of the fans and like party promoters and people they only validate you when like a, a nigga that's bigger like shows that he fucks with you. So like you know like 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 let's say a Vezo like a Vezo I don't know Vezo's artist, but like a little nigga come up making music, been doing music for a long time. But niggas ain't gonna fuck with him until Vezo say, yo, I fuck with this little nigga. Yeah. Then everybody's like, oh, I fuck with him. You know what I'm saying? That's he cold. But like, then the little nigga music couldn't don't even gotta be good or not. You know what I'm saying? They just wanna see the next nigga popping, fucking with you. That's true. And that's kind of like, you know, like I've never been, that's why I've been in a position where I could done music with all these niggas. You know what I'm saying? But like, I never wanted to because I don't know these niggas. I'm not one of them type of people that, like, granted, it's good to network and get to know people, absolutely, but, like, I don't know them, and, like, I can't, like, fake relationships and just, like, kind of just eat off they buzz. Like, I'm not that type of nigga. Like, we can, if it's if it's, if it's it's genuine and it's, like, a like we in a studio or whatever, or bro's like, yo, you know, bro wants to do a song with you, we link and we do a song, that's one thing, but I'm not going to be tapping in, like, hey, can you uh, tell... Tell bro I want to do a song with him, and then like we just he sends me over a verse, and I send that over. Like it's not, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like it's you not, want that real studio connection, yeah, that vibe. Exactly, most definitely. I feel like the first artist really that was really on that like real shit with me is uh, Jay Swan. Like mm. that nigga is one of the realest niggas in the city. Like I ain't even have a buzz. Like bro came to the studio, came there. He didn't say send me the verse over. Bro came to the studio, locked in, did his verse right there, all love, posted the song, still reaches out to this day. You know what I'm saying? Like, a lot of niggas think that, nah, that I'm not around BJ anymore, you know what I'm saying? Like, they can't fuck with me. And that goes to a lot of party promoters. That goes to a lot of, like, like engineers, like, DJs, all that shit. Like, niggas just feel like, oh, he ain't, he ain't part of that wave no more, so I can't fuck with that nigga. And that's where I knew, like, I knew niggas only fucked with me because BJ. And that's why I didn't really fuck with people. You know what I'm saying? It was never really genuine. Well, no, because you got to look at it. If you're selling out shows and shit like that, and there's people pulling up and doing all this shit, that means the fans and the supporters fucked with you. Yeah. Maybe that you're talking about the scene, maybe. Maybe the people the in. The scene. Yeah, yeah, the people in the scene, maybe. But at the same time, it's like, kind of who gives a fuck about them? Because if you're blowing up in Canada anyway, like... You know, yeah. like isn't the network there anyway? Like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. kind of different. That's I true. Feel like, I feel like you just all it is for real is you just need somebody to help you re-strategize it, and that's it. Like, that's it, man. Yeah, you know absolutely right on that for yeah. sure, for sure. Yeah, man. Kind of got lazy on like uh, figuring it out. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you said, I need somebody to help strategize what the fuck I got Bro, going on. Bro, some artists need managers, some don't. That's the way absolutely. I look at it. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Some like they got so much going on, they got so much talent, they got so many uh, big fan base, they have so many things to delegate. They don't have time to fucking figure out this. And I'm like that, man. I'm like, I got so much shit going on, bro. I don't. I need somebody to do this shit, but yeah. I'm moving so slow right now because of the fact that I don't have somebody else managing a certain sector that I just don't understand and get and don't yeah. have the keys to. So. It's hard for people to do it independently, especially yeah. or when they have the talent and the skill to prove that they do need a manager. So right now, um, have you been releasing new music? Do you have any projects that you've been showcasing or anything like that? Um, no, I've been taking it slow. I just dropped a song, I think, uh, uh, July or August. What was the reciprocation like? 
Like, you know, it was the same. It was kind of just the same shit. You know, that's fire. You know what I'm saying? Have, it gets shared good amount of times. You know what I'm saying? That's fire, fire, fire. But it's not. You know, I was part of We Up. You know what I'm saying? The record We Up, still to this day, I feel like one of the biggest, best songs to come out of Detroit. So, like, I'm kind of trying to chase that. Talk about that process, man. Talk about that song and how it came together. That song really, you know, that's, I feel like that song changed my life more, not like changing it financially or anything, but it changed my life more on the, like, opening my mind up to what, not just me, but we're capable of, like, like I said, like we're not really a work that gang group anymore, none of that. But like, mm. it's still like my like my big like my big homies and shit like that. Like Cino, that's big bro. Like BJ, big bro. You know what I'm saying? We might not do music and shit no more together, but like those are my dogs. But like, it kind of just like I said, just opened my mind up to what capable of. Like, it was just a big ass experience. I knew the day we was in the studio, Dre Butters, and the mastermind behind it all, literally. Like it was his birthday, mm. and he was just like, I'm feeling like winning. And it was just while he was making the beat, and it was like his girl brought a bottle to the studio. I was like, bring out the bottles of rose, type shit. And like it was just coming together, and I just knew I wasn't even supposed to be on the song. I was just in the studio, and I'm watching it come together. I'm watching Cena shaking his head, coming up with a verse. I'm like, oh, this nigga about to snap. And then the next day, like I said, I went on the song. Next day, uh, Cena told me, yo, hey, your verse ready with the woo. So I'm like, damn, had a verse ready for we up. I'm about to get on this bitch. So I didn't know I was about to record it the same night. He called me to the studio that night, uh, BNB Studio. I go downstairs, this nigga Mario Chalmers down there. What the fuck? Yeah, like some random <laughs> Mario Chalmers in the studio, you know what I'm saying? Some, like some random crazy shit. So like, I'm one of the people, bro, like, I make good ass music, but like I like to be real private. Like I don't like I kind of get discouraged when other people are around me because I don't like to seek others' opinions. Mm. I only like to like do my own thing, even though I need to like hear that constructive criticism. I like to do my own thing, finish the master product, and then get it. But like so, like when I went down there, I'm like, oh, this is about to be crazy. Like I know it's about to be difficult for me. But like I went in the stool, I went in the booth, man, was just snapping, talking crazy, whatever, did my thing on it. I remember one part on the song, I was like, would you rather argue with that Buick or that new range? And that nigga Mario was like, say that Moosein, nigga, I got one of them bitches with the woo. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, oh, shit, you know what I'm saying? He gave me that bar. I ain't gonna lie, arguing that Buick or that Moosein type shit. So came out the stool, and, like, we just played that bitch, bro, and you just knew it was a hit record right there. Like, the next, and then we spent the whole week having live guitars come through that bitch, laying guitar strings on that motherfucker, all that. Mm. And then we finished the record, put it out, and then the outcome of it was just crazy. Wow. I honestly feel like, you know, Work That Gang as a whole really brought Motown music back. You know what I'm saying? Like, that different wave of music, we really amped that shit back. For sure, for sure. Man. Because before that, it was really, you know what I'm saying, just rap, Detroit rap. No niggas really came. I'm feeling like, wait a minute, got a lot of time. And I know, you know what I'm saying? No niggas was coming like that. Butters came like that, bro, and just set. He basically set it, set stone right there. Man. Man, yeah. that's super wild, man. Was there any other songs that those collaborations like that came together? Or was that like the most notable for you? That was really the most notable. But, you know, Work That Gang as a whole, we did shit. We did Hood Vibes, Poppin'. We did a couple records that was, that was big, but We Up was the one that stuck out. And really did his thing. Like I remember, man, we did we had a show. We did uh this was right when the baby was blowing up. He wasn't even fully blown up yet. We opened up for the baby in Columbus, like summer jams or some shit like that. Yeah. So some crazy shit, bro. Off we up. And like the they didn't know the record, but like you know when people are fucking with the record. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They out there like, oh shit. Yeah. Bobbing their head, all that shit, you know what I'm saying? So that was lit. And that was a different experience for me because I ain't never experienced shit like that. What do you think like uh was the biggest milestone for you in your entire career? Um, biggest milestone, honestly. Felt like uh being a part of that record one. Biggest milestone that changed my life was being B uh DJ BJ though. Mm. I wouldn't be G baby without DJ BJ. Mm. So I'm a, I'll give him his flowers for that, for sure, for sure. Like I remember shit. I was nineteen, I had 80 bucks. My dad let me borrow $20. Gave that nigga $100 for that interview. My whole life changed after that. 
Word. You know what I'm saying? I was like, after an interview? At an, uh, after an interview. Because of the connection made or because of the interview? Because of the connection made. He was doing one on one sit downs with everybody. You know what I'm saying? But I remember Camille, that was like his old assistant, playing like my music and shit like that. And she tapped him and like shook her head. And he just turned around and was like, What's your plans? What you trying to do? And I'm like, shit, that's why I'm here. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, as an artist, I feel like you can only take yourself as far as you could take yourself mm. in certain situations. You know what I'm saying? You can, you can, like, you got them artists that just get lucky, throw a song on TikTok, pop and blow, but they're here today and gone tomorrow. Right. I'm not trying to be one of them. You know what I'm saying? I like longevity. Do you think, like, um, artists should stay in their lanes, comedians should stay in their lanes, podcasters should stay in their lanes, directors should stay in their lanes, or do you think this kind of sampling different ideas out randomly here and there is okay? I think it's like, yeah, I think they should, but it depends, you know what I'm saying? It's like, if you're good at what you're doing, like, say if you're, I know a cameraman that's a rapper now, and the nigga coat, he put the camera down and put Talk the mic Emilio? No, no, him too, though. Oh, okay. Emilio, Emilio's the shit, for sure. Yeah. But uh, what's his name? I can't think of the nigga name off top, but he cold. Mm. He cold. He be dropping video. He ain't got no big buzz, mm. but this shit could blow up. He's different. He kind of on, like, the lane like I'm on. You know what I'm saying? So he started off as a videographer, put that shit down, put the mic up. No, yeah. no, I'm not saying put something down and pick something else up. I'm saying, like, if you're, let's say, a rapper, do you think a rapper should start a podcast? Like, that's my... Oh, n- no, no, because shit. Like, what you're doing, it takes 100% time, effort, thought, everything into it if you <laughs> want it to become successful. Yes. So once you start, like, dipping your hand and, or dipping your feet into every little thing, you're going to get lost. Like you was just saying, like, I got so much shit going on sometimes I... You're going to get lost. Yeah. You're trying to do this, 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 this. Do this. Make it work. And then you could branch off and do that, then that, then that. You know what I'm saying? But make that shit work first before, you know what I'm saying? If you like a Jerry Productions and then you want to make a song, that's one thing. You done made a million, you done came up off, you know what I'm saying, Re- recording and doing videos and shit like that. But yeah. definitely should stay in your lane until it pay off on what you dedicated to. For sure, for sure. When you look at your own career, what you've accomplished so far, and the talent and the skill, and like you said, you have a, a lot of songs in the vault, um, you're seeing the scene and what's happening with it. Do you think it's going to be easy, or do you think it's going to be easier to bring your sound to Detroit now and have Detroit fuck with it now that it's kind of a more open scene, or do you think it's still going to be like selective towards different demographics, like different states or countries? Mm. Repeat that one more time. So basically, yeah. like... The scene is probably a little bit more relaxed and open-minded compared to when you were popping off in Canada, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you think now re-emerging, you're going to have a better shot in Detroit, building a fan base in Detroit? It's going to be a little harder for me now because I don't got BJ behind me no more. Yeah, so, but... Yeah, I see, okay, go ahead. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just... then that kind of dates back to what I said. I feel like in Detroit, like, they want to see you fucking with that nigga before they fuck with you. Like... You know what I'm saying? Like, if BJ ain't supporting my shit or behind my shit anymore, like, I feel like a lot of people, not fans, because fans are fans. Like, they're going to love your shit. They're going to support you. They're going to rock with you. But it's about, like, just just being in the scene. Like, you know how niggas in the scene be like, it just take, I don't know, man. It just takes, it takes for another person to validate you for people to accept you, I feel like. That's my opinion. I really feel like that, though. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I was... If I was peasy and you was rapping and nobody knew who the fuck you was, and I was like, "This nigga cold, I fuck with him," and post you one time. That's what happened. Like when I was when I started shooting videos, the first person to um shout me out was Sada Baby, and that's what? literally where I, uh, that's literally a vouch. Oh. Like yo, that guy's this guy's legit. And then everybody started fucking with me after this. Right so I know what you're talking about. It's exactly. because Sada was fucking with you. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's not because your. I mean, it. Of course, your hard work got you there. Yeah, fact. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, on the same note as you, it's like you got everything going. It's not like because somebody fucked with you alone that you were successful. It's because you they fucked with you and you had the skill and talent and ability. But I do agree with you, bro. Some people are, like, vouching for people that do confuse me sometimes. Where I'm yeah. like, bro, that shit makes no, no Does he sense. have a gun to your head or something, bro? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But, like, and then, like, how we is is, like, a city, like, that's what we want to see. Like, if that nigga fucking with you, I fuck with you now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't know. It, it's weird to me, bro. You know, that's what I'm trying to figure. I'm kind of lost trying to figure that out now. Even revamping myself completely. Like, what's it going to take for me to revamp myself? Like, I don't know if it's going to be, like, a Sada Baby or a Vezo Shami. I'm like, yeah, G-Baby the shit. Like, 
I fuck with that nigga music. Like, fuck with them type shit. I don't think so. Right. I think these days promoting yourself on these mo- social media platforms like Detroit Rap News, uh, Detroit Rap Daily, Hip Hop Lab, and all of them. Yeah. If you find a creative way to market and strategize yourself and just flood the market, people are just going to naturally associate you with Detroit and that you're accepted in Detroit. Yeah. I think these platforms are more important now than ever. Detroit Rap News, the Hip Hop Lab, and Detroit Rap Daily are super, super important because it does feel like, all right, these platforms wouldn't be posting the shit if this wasn't Detroit or yeah. if they weren't relevant in Detroit, especially no, if you're absolutely. consistent and you're fired. For sure, People for are sure. going to fuck with you for sure. You're right. Um, so that's that's all I think you got to do. The biggest thing, being consistent. Yeah, You know exactly. what I'm saying? Yeah. I just, I feel like, my biggest problem with being consistent is I'm able to because I have the music. It's just like I don't want to just drop music and have the same listeners hear it because I really honestly feel like my shit's next level. Like, yeah. like so like I don't want to just drop it in the same like I got 16,000 followers, the same. But you know how the algorithm work. Probably 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 people seeing it. Yeah. So I don't want to drop that shit in the same 5,000 people say, see it. I'd rather hit Say Cheese, Hip Hop Lab, all this at once, but comes with that, a budget. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, with me kind of just growing up, really just jumping off the porch, what I call get my own house shit, you know what I'm saying? All that other shit, it's like, it's kind of hard to match everything because now I got bills, real boy bills, you know what I'm saying? Big boy bills and shit. Like, I got a shit, I financed a motherfucking car with bad credit and a nice ass car. So, you know, I'm paying out the ass for that. Like, And that shows another thing too, like, even though this is kind of some, not secret sauce, but kind of some sauce. But, you know, that's why the features are important. And I know you're not too, like, you know, set on those things or, like, set on, like, telling, like, an artist you need a feature. But the reason these features are so important is because, let's say, for instance, Skilla Baby. Well, now he's kind of blew up already, so it's kind of too late. But let's say, mm-hmm. for instance, two months ago, you hit up Skilla Baby. You said, hey, Skilla Baby, I got $10,000 for you. I need seven songs. Now people are going to associate you with Skilla Baby, even Absolutely. if Skilla Baby doesn't even fuck with you. Absolutely. You so is right. Absolutely. I know you do have kind of like a thing against like uh, features and stuff like that, but that's another a way of kind of breaching the doors a little bit and getting that acceptance in Detroit. Absolutely. I don't know. That might just be my stubbornness, bro, because you you absolutely right on that. And I kind of felt like it's I've been known that shit, too. You know what I'm saying? I've been known it. I don't know if it's like I just don't know how to approach people, maybe. Because, like, even blowing up when I was underneath BJ, like, a lot of people thought I was, like, arrogant and shit, but it was never that, bro. I was never arrogant, rude, disrespectful, nothing. I just don't know how to approach people or really just talk to people. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I really just keep to myself. I'm just one of them niggas, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't just... And it's not about smiling in people's faces and shit like that, you know what I'm saying? But it's just... It's a certain thing to it. Like, it's definitely what I was missing, most mostly, even still right now, is networking. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I, I need to I need to build up my ability to network better. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Yeah, man. But you at least know? you're at least you're aware of it consciously. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um listen, man, this has been an awesome talk, bro. And I'm I'm kind of excited to see what you're gonna do from here and uh what, what kind of the next moves are and seeing you build up in Detroit. I fuck with you, bro. I feel like uh when I see when I see you start making moves and stuff like that, I'm definitely gonna be one of the people to making sure that like you get circulated out there and people see what's going on. Appreciate it. And that, obviously, man. uh, you know, I'm tapped in with a lot of these uh the, a lot of the platforms and make sure that they know like, yo, circulate you because just having this talk alone with you, you feel like a real artist. Like it's it's a lost thing to say I'm talking to a real artist, like someone who's actually passionate about making music and creating uh, and working on the craft and building themselves. And you already established yourself in a different area, which is extremely hard to do. Right. So uh, you got my support, man, 100%. I appreciate that, bro. Tell everybody how they can find you on social media, bro. Uh, Shit, on Instagram. I don't be on Twitter like that, but everything the same thing, bro. It's G-Baby. I-T-S-G-E-E-B-A-B-Y. And uh, follow me. I'll fuck around. Follow you back. You know how that go. You got music, man. Let's tap in, too. I'm... It's time to network. Yeah, it's time, time to, to work with artists, all that <laughs> shit. So, shit, you fucking with my shit, I'm fucking with your shit, man. Let's work. Let's get it. For sure. What's uh, Parallel Sound Studio hosts these productions for us. We're uh, High Low Visual shoots these productions for us. We're out. Peace.